Tonight, Apple's holding a big event soon. Is this an iPhone 6 for everyone? Plus, Russian crime rings deals over a billion passwords. And the end of Justin TV. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 144 for Tuesday, August 5th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. Recode reports that Apple has scheduled a big media event for Tuesday, September 9th, and notes that, like Apple's September events in previous years, it will focus on Apple's next-gen iPhones. Those are pretty widely expected to feature larger displays, possibly at 4.7 and 5.5 inches, and run new A8 processors. For what it's worth, Apple has declined comment. The company is, though, talking about its App Store numbers. Apple tells CNBC that its App Store saw record-setting revenue numbers in July and that its App Store saw a record number of customers making transactions that month. CEO Tim Cook tells the news outlet, quote, I couldn't be happier. This is the best execution of any quarter since I've been at Apple. The New York Times reports that a Russian crime ring has collected the largest known amount of stolen internet credentials, which includes 1.2 billion username and password combinations and more than 500 million email addresses. Hold Security, which is a firm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that uncovered the theft last year of tens of millions of records from Adobe Systems, says that the current stolen information includes confidential material gathered from 420,000 websites. Hold Securities isn't naming the victims, but an unaffiliated security expert tells the Times that the theft is authentic. It appears that so far the criminals haven't sold many of these records, are using them instead to send spam on social networks and then collecting fees for that work. But personal credentials, like an email address or a social security number or a password, can obviously be used for identity theft at a later time. In other frightening security news, Joshua Rogers, a 17-year-old Australian security researcher, says that PayPal's two-factor authentication can be circumvented and has published the details on his blog. Now, he says he alerted PayPal back on June 5th, but the company didn't fix the issue, so he went public. Now, by going public, Rogers forfeits a reward that PayPal usually pays out to security researchers that requires confidentiality until a vulnerability is fixed. Rogers thinks that the reward might have been around $3,000, didn't get a specific number from PayPal, though, and says he doesn't even care about the money. He also posted a video of the attack on YouTube. Last month, Rogers accepted a caution from Australian police rather than face charges for discovering a vulnerability in the website of one of the country's public transport authorities last year. A new report from analyst firm Str Strategy Analytics says that Google's Android OS global market share is at a whopping 85%. 85% global share. But it also notes that much of that market share is based on the Android Open Source Project, or AOSP, a freer version that lets device makers customize handsets to run other software and services and de-emphasize Google, also known as forking Android. A new report from ABI Research says that 20% of the smartphones that shipped worldwide between May and July of this year were based on AOSP, and that number is rising, a 20% increase on the previous quarter. Now, Google's new standard, Android One, has its services baked in and will potentially help the company get its foot back into potential revenues with sub $100 smartphones in developing markets. Fox announced today that it has withdrawn its $80 billion bid for Time Warner Cable. In a statement, CEO Rupert Murdoch's claims that Time Warner CEO Jeff Bukes would not sit down and negotiate with him. <laughs> Murdoch says that with the saved money, he plans to buy back $6 billion of Fox's stock. Time Warner's and Fox's earnings calls are both scheduled for tomorrow. Reuters has acquired an internal memo sent to BlackBerry employees that the company has finished a restructuring process. BlackBerry CEO John Chen writes that, quote, barring any unexpected downturns in the market, we will be adding headcount in certain areas such as product development, sales, and customer service 
beginning in modest numbers. BlackBerry shrank its workforce around 60% over the last three years. Chen took over eight months ago and has attempted to stabilize the company by selling non-core assets, partnering to make manufacturing and supply chains more efficient, and raising cash via sales of the company's real estate holdings in its hometown of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Coming up, the electric car that beat the 26-year-old speed record on one charge. And what has happened to Justin TV? Up next, I'll talk with Eric Johnson from Recode about all those details. But first, let's thank Personal Capital for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. Personal Capital solves two barriers to growing your wealth. I would like to be more wealthy. Here's the problem. It's hard to keep track of, track of stocks and 401ks. There's multiple ones and you've got different logins and the bank accounts and your money might be spread around. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it takes a lot of effort to make sure that you're on top of everything. If you pay somebody to manage your money for you, well, you're paying too much because personal capital brings all of your accounts and assets onto a single screen. You can access this information on your computer, on your phone, on your tablet. There are real-time intuitive graphs. Personal Capital has a award-winning watch app. You can download it in the Google Play Store right now. It integrates with Personal Capital on other Android devices. So as a user, as an Android user, you've got relevant and timely updates on your finances. Personal Capital shows how much you're overpaying in fees and then also gives you advice on how to reduce those fees, plus advice on optimizing your investment. So signing up takes just a minute and it'll pay you back. Save some money. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, that's right, free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Personal Capital is free and it's the smart way to grow your money. And we thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, joining us now is Eric Johnson, associate editor over for the gaming section of Recode. Hey, Eric. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for being here. Thanks I mentioned having. before the break that Justin TV is kaput. I've seen it yeah. all over the web. People who are familiar with Justin TV, but Justin TV is it, it's had quite an evolution, really, from its beginning days to 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 what just recently shut down. So, what happened? So yeah, that's uh, evolution is one heck of an understatement. Yeah, uh, a lot of people I think heard about Justin TV back in 2007 when it first debuted. Then it was a 24/7 reality show devoted to broadcasting the life of one person, Justin Khan. Mm -hmm. And so he was going around with a camera strapped to his head and just broadcasting just what was going on in his life, just normal day-to-day -day stuff. I used to see him at parties in San Francisco. It was fascinating, yeah. really. Yeah, exactly. And so he was sort of this. He was all over the TV circuit. He was he was he was everywhere. It was sort sort of this uh, this internet novelty. And this was less than a year, of course, after Google bought YouTube for one point six billion dollars. So, video was pretty hot. Um, but then what happened was then by the end of the year, people were starting to say, you know, well, you know, we want to broadcast our own stuff. And so, uh, and they also apparently were complaining that Justin's life was a little bit too boring for their case after the novelty wore off a little bit. So what happened was then the company opened it up. They made it possible for a lot of people to broadcast their lives. Uh, they were called life casters. And then after that, then it became possible for people to broadcast all sorts of content, basically anything that was on their computer or what have you. All right, so that was where Justin TV was, uh, you know, kind of at this point. I know uh, being in the podcasting business ourselves, uh, a lot of our Twit audience is also very familiar with Justin TV. It was a way to, mm -hmm. to watch Twit content as well as a lot of other things. But the Justin TV folks did overlap with a company called Twitch. Isn't that right? Right. So in late 2010, there was a sort of a, you know, a skunk works initiative inside Justin TV where they had these two projects going. One of them was to figure out ways to make live video streaming work on mobile. That became a startup called Social Cam, which Autodesk bought back two years ago for 60 million. And the other Skunk Works project was basically improving the video gaming content on Justin TV. Video games were incredibly popular. They were one of the most popular types of content on the site that people were, were broadcasting themselves playing the games. And so what happened was there was this project too, well, let's, let's beef up the section, let's make it a little bit better. And over the months that turned into actually making a spinoff website that became Twitch TV which then later shortened its name to just Twitch. So Twitch has been extremely popular. Uh, right. We've definitely reported here on TN2 that, you know, at times it's taking up a large percentage of all internet traffic uh, because of such huge audience numbers. 
What's happening with Twitch and why does that mean Justin TV is sh shutting its doors? So earlier this year, Twitch actually became the name of the overall company that was once Justin TV. It's now called Twitch Interactive. So this has been kind of something that's been in expected for a while, actually. Um, just over time, interest in the general purpose sort of live streaming uh, seems to have dropped off a lot, uh, even though um, the kind of anything goes uh, video on demand side of YouTube seems to be doing fine. Uh, the, the live streaming still seems to be, you know, um, live streaming without really a focus doesn't really seem to have caught on or at least has has stayed popular. But whereas live streaming of video games, which is what specifically Twitch has done, has actually maintained to managed to keep on growing its audience. So back in the month that it launched in June of 2011, it had 3.2 million viewers that month. This most recent July, it had 50 million. And those viewers spend a lot of time watching video games. Uh, I think uh, towards the, yeah, in, in 2013, uh, Twitch's viewers, uh, more than half of them spent more than 20 hours per week watching videos on the site. Can we assume that this is the beginning of the end for live casting? Or is this just <laughs> one company that's decided that a pivot was the right decision? It was actually kind of interesting because in the official, you know, sorry, we're, we're closing this down sort of in, in, the, in the page explaining the, the shutdown, they said, well, you know, there's still other live streaming options out there. And they said, you know, if you want to check out Ustream or YouTube's live options or uh, live cast. And, and yeah, they, they said, you know, there's still options out there, but it just seems like Twitch Interactive, they, they, they want to focus on where they're doing well right now. End of an era for sure. Thank you, Eric Johnson, the associate editor over at Gaming at Recode. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, they can find me at Recode.net and on Twitter at HeyHeyESJ. Oh, that's a good Twitter handle. Thanks Thank so you. much, Eric. Thanks for having me. All right, finally, the University of New South Wales in Australia says that an electric car that was built internally has set a new record for how fast an electric car can go over a long distance on a single charge. The university claims that the SunSwift traveled at an average of just over 62 miles per hour for over 300 miles or 500 kilometers. The previous record that stood for 26 years was an electric car traveling at an average of just over 45 miles per hour for the same distance. The Federation Internationale de l'Automobile, hope I said that right, still needs to verify the claim before the new record is official. But if it goes through, the SunSwift will have set a dramatically improved figure for what can be done with an electric car. By the way, its roof has solar panels on it so that the battery can be continually recharged, though those panels were disabled while trying to set the record. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.